Welcome to Dialogue Across Difference, an event series hosted by the Center for the Study of Politics and Governance at the University of Minnesota's Humphrey School of Public Affairs. Join us as Center Director Larry Jacobs and guests engage in conversations across the political and policy spectrum on issues of the day. Good afternoon. I'm Professor Larry Jacobs. I direct the Center for the Study of Politics and Governance at the University of Minnesota's Humphrey School of Public Affairs, and we are pleased to be bringing you this program today. Um, before we begin, I want to encourage you uh, to participate. And you'll see at the bottom of the screen, that helpful little arrow, there's a Q&A button. Click it. Give us your questions. We'll get to as many as possible. If you would like a live transcript that's also being produced um, and the same thing, just click on that and you'll get that, um, that service as well. Welcome and thank you for joining us for today's program. Our guest is Congressman Tom Emmer. Uh, Congressman Emmer represents Minnesota's sixth congressional district um, and he's chairman of the National Republican Congressional Committee, which works to elect Republicans to the U.S. House of Representatives. He's a member of the Republican Deputy uh, Whip Team and is seen as the uh, quarterback for Republicans in their efforts to regain a majority in Congress. Um, before serving in Congress, um, Mr. Emmer was a member of the Minnesota House of Representatives where he served for two terms. Um, Congressman Emmer, thank you so much for joining us. I know you got a busy, busy life and we appreciate you taking the time to, to stop in and chat with us. Great to be with you, Larry. So a couple of years ago, we did something like this. It was before the general election. And you and I had a cordial conversation about how the Republicans were gonna do in the congressional races. And I was, um, you know, mostly talking about what the conventional wisdom was, which was the Democrats would gain seats, particularly if the polls are right, that that um, that Joe Biden would get more votes in the presidential election. I was wrong. You were right. Um, I don't know. I, you were right a little bit, too. Yeah. But in terms of winning the, the House, you know, winning seats in the House in a year in which Joe Biden won a majority of the uh, popular vote. Um, it was a surprising outcome. Um, we rarely see that, uh, where one party wins the White House and the other party picks up seats um, in the House. And I've been giving that a lot of thought. And I think there are you know, a couple reasons for that. Um, one reason is that you and your colleagues have done a great job um, finding candidates that fit districts. They reflect the district. And one of the areas where you've done that, it's been you know, really stark, and I've kind of looked into this a little bit, is in terms of recruiting women and candidates of color. Um, 2018, um, the last midterm election, there were 13 candidates of color. Um, I'm sorry, there were 13 women. There was one black Republican in the House. Um, now you shoot ahead to 2022, and there are more women and Hispanics um, running for office under the Republican label than ever before. It's, it's an impressive turnaround. Has that been a conscious, deliberate uh, strategy that you've been pursuing? Yeah, for four years. <clears throat> Again, thanks for having me, Larry. And I, you know, I don't count them. Uh, that's not the, uh, the point of the exercise, but when my colleagues gave me this position uh, four years ago, uh, one of the primary missions was to make sure that uh, our candidates and quite frankly, our conference uh, ultimately looks and sounds more like the districts uh, that we represent. And uh, you correctly point out, we had 13 women uh, voting members, but with the territories, we actually had 15 women and boy, that's nothing to be screaming about. Uh, we more than doubled that number last time. And uh, 
you know, we added uh, Korean Americans from California. Uh, we added Burgess Owens, uh, uh, Byron Donalds. Uh, these are not just uh, candidates who became incumbents, uh, Larry. They're leaders. They're already leaders within the conference, and they're examples of uh, when you go out to recruit. So I, I changed the recruiting. Uh, recruiting on our side, I'm, I can't tell you what the Dems were doing, but on our side, I think far too often uh, very well-paid consultants, campaign uh, advisors in Washington, D.C. Uh, were telling us who the best candidate were. And, and that's just not the way uh, to go. I'm not going to criticize like most people do. Uh, those that make their living running campaigns and doing all that, they do a great job. Uh, obviously, they're like anybody else in the marketplace. Some are better than others. But they shouldn't tell us who the best candidate is because they will typically have a financial uh, bias. You know, maybe they find a candidate, I hate the term, oh, this is a self-funder. He or she can put a lot of their own money into the race. I'm tired of that. I mean, I think those are difficult candidates because uh, they're not used to people telling them what they don't want to hear. Uh, they're tough to manage. Uh, but this is what uh, the consultant class likes because, of course, their bills are going to get paid. Uh, it's better off if that candidate comes from the grassroots. And what we did is we empowered our delegations. You know, I, I figured somebody from Texas knows uh, who's on the bench in Texas much better than somebody from Minnesota. Same thing about New York, and it goes on and on. And the result, the result was uh, dramatic. I mean, like you say, uh, we have recruited extremely well, but I would say that's more the districts themselves have been doing the recruiting. Uh, we've got a record number of women again. We've got a record number of uh, uh, candidates from minority communities. We've got a, a record number of uh, Black candidates, record number of Hispanic candidates, record number of Asian Americans that are running uh, as Republicans for the U.S. House of Representatives. And, uh, you know, you're right. It's something I'm extremely proud of if you think about this going back. And I wasn't going to bring up what you uh what you brought up, because you remember when that thing ended, you said, well, I don't agree with you, but uh, we'll see when the midterms or when the uh, election comes around. And I'm eating crow right now. No, no, I, I wasn't going to do that to you. You are not, you're not like David Wasserman and the Cook Report and these guys that all cover their backside. You actually walked out on the edge and said, this is what I think. And you and I had an honest disagreement. Uh, granted, it was unfair because I think I knew things internally that uh, you perhaps did not have uh, uh, at your fingertips. You were looking at all of the information that those people were putting out. I actually had uh, polls on the inside that we were doing that we, we knew that we were going to do well. We didn't know we were going to do that well, but I had said uh, from day one, on a really good night. If the presidency goes our way, uh, we could do 25 seats plus. And then I would tell everybody, and this is about six months out, because you win campaigns with good candidates, with the right message and with enough resources. And by six months out, I knew what our candidate field looked like. Uh, and I would tell people, if we just have a good night, we're gonna pick up eight to 12 seats. As it turns out, Larry, uh, we didn't lose any incumbent for the first time since 1994, and there was a specific formula for that. But the thing I'm most proud of, getting back to your question, is we not only picked up uh, 15 seats, more than I thought, uh, but every one of them was uh, a female or a candidate from a, a minority community or a veteran or all three. It was uh, pretty impressive, and I think we'll be better at it this time. It's actually, you know, the polls are really quite remarkable, and I'm going to focus on Latinos. Uh, back in 2018, the polls were showing Democrats had an advantage among Latinos of more than 40 points. And today it's just about a parity. Democrats have a small, tiny advantage. And, you know, part of it um, are the candidates that are being recruited and their message, which is about uh, border security. It's about crime. It's about jobs and inflation and, and other issues. And clearly that's, that's been resonating. And you know, to be honest, I think this is one of the weaknesses in the Democratic Party. They make assumptions about what Latino voters are looking for. Um, and race and immigration are not the top issues. They're really, you know, three quarters of Latinos are working class and they want to see jobs. They want to see, um, you know, their wages uh, amounting to more than inflation. So, you know, kudos to you uh, for lining up the candidate with the district. That's not always easy work. 
Well, I, I appreciate it. But I, Larry, I think it goes to a bigger thing. You, you correctly point out all that stuff. But I believe that uh, we are living through one of the greatest political realignments of our time. And I don't think it's just Hispanic voters. Uh, I think it's every minority community that has traditionally voted Democrat, frankly, is uh, stepping out of that car and they're now standing on the street corner. They don't love Republicans, but uh, they came to this country or they're raised with a great work ethic. It's about their family. It's about their freedom. It's about their vision of the American dream that they want to pursue. And if there's one thing that's important, and you kind of said it, but I'm going to put it in different words, it's listening to the people. I don't think my colleagues on the other side of the aisle are listening at all, because uh, these people just want to be safe in their communities. They want their kids to have an opportunity for a better life than they've had. They want to be able to chase the American dream. And right now, they're looking at my grandfather's Democrats uh, who are in charge. I'm not saying the whole party. But they're looking at uh, my grandfather's Democrat Party, the leadership, as not doing those things. And, it, and I'm going to say it's every minority community because I'm going to take you back to, I think it was in June, and please correct me, everything's running together now. But there was a city election in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. uh, my colleague, Kevin McCarthy, uh, tells me that there's 5.7% registered Republicans in the city of San Francisco. I think that sounds a little high, but I'll go with it. He's from California. I, I tell you that because this wasn't a Republican Democrat thing, as you know, Larry. I, they kicked out the uh, the DA, uh, the district attorney, or the the city attorney that was not prosecuting crime. You know, they have all kinds of problems with uh, smashing grabs and people just walking in and taking things. Uh, the important thing to take from that for me is you realize that the highest turnout in that uh, San Francisco city election was actually in lower income, minority dominated precincts. I, again, it's you gotta listen to the voters and you gotta pay attention to what they're telling you. And you can't say defund the police and then turn around and say, I'm, I'm, not, I'm in favor of fully funding the police and then have mixed messages on the other side You know when you don't prosecute. So uh, that's just one of many, but yeah, there's let a me, change going on. Let me, let me uh, kind of continue this uh, focus on the fit between um, districts and the candidates. Uh, Henry Olson, who you know, conservative Republican, you know, with credentials that go back to Ronald Reagan. He had a, a, a piece in the Washington Post, and the title of it is, The GOP is Blowing Its Chances to Make the Midterms a Referendum on Democrats. And he goes on to say that the... Um, that the Republicans are stepping on their own opportunity or they're creating political distractions. And the number one issue he focuses on is abortion. Um, you've got, you know, I would, I would say that kind of really startling result in, uh, in Kansas where you had a very strict abortion um, uh, referendum shot down by a large majority. You just had the Indiana legislature pass a pretty strict abortion rule and there are a lot of folks, including folks like Henry Olson, who are loyal Republicans, um, who are saying, wait a second, Republicans have got a winning formula here, as you've been talking about, but here's abortion coming along after the Supreme Court decision, and they're, they're being too extreme. They're not listening to women. What do you say to that? Well, uh, first off, I think uh, the Dobbs decision, returning this decision back to the uh, states, uh, interesting how we've been marching away from federalism for well over 100 years, uh, trying to put all the power uh, from the local authority, you know, from your township, your city into the county, from the county to the, to the state, from the state to the federal government. And essentially what Dobbs said is that is a state issue. It's not uh, listed in uh, the U.S. Constitution. Therefore, uh, this should go back to the people of that state. And what you see in places like Indiana and Kansas is that's exactly what's happening. People in this country, what I'm seeing, Larry, they want more control over their own decisions. They want more local control. They want their their uh, they want to be the ones that make up their mind instead of some invisible bureaucrat far away. So I think uh, while it's a great narrative, I uh, keep in mind 
uh, the narrative out there is anything but what voters are truly concerned about. And I, I do polling. We consume more polling than any entity in America. <laughs> At the NRC, we do. We've got 429 of the 435 races. I can tell you right now, the issues have not changed. Uh, they haven't changed in months. Number one issue is inflation and the economy. Number two is still crime. Uh, in fact, the legislative, uh, whatever the entity is that represents the state legislatures nationally, they did polling so. the, day, the day after uh, uh, the uh, Dobbs decision. Now, remember, uh, this narrative was already out there after the Alito opinion was leaked. So uh, in essence, my colleagues on the other side of the aisle were already pushing this narrative for almost two months. The day after the Dobbs decision was published, uh, the uh, legislative equivalent of our organization did a survey in the battleground districts across the country, and abortion finished a distant fourth in terms of uh, the issues. And that's when you would imagine it was at its peak in terms of intensity. I think uh, much like Republicans looked at the Kavanaugh hearings at the end of uh, September, early October, two years ago, when you had about a seven point bump on the Republican side, uh, you may recall, Larry, by the time people went into the voting booth, that was not the issue that uh, they were concerned with. Uh, so while I think in, abortion is, uh, is an important issue, it's something that we should monitor and watch, it's not uh, moving the needle contrary to uh, what uh, some, of these, uh, some of these narratives are. And I think a, a big part of this and why Olson was waving a red flag to Republican allies is about mobilization, about turnout, about enthusiasm. And while it's true, the ranking of the issues is, as you've described, with inflation, number one, and crime, what you are saying is that voters who might have been willing to sit out the midterm elections, which happens more with Democrats than Republicans, um, now we're starting to see the enthusiasm numbers and the uh, interest in turning out. CBS News did a, a survey about um, whether the Dobbs decision would make you more or less likely to turn out and vote. 50% of Democrats said yes, 20% of Republicans. And there are a bunch of other polls showing something pretty similar. And you know, I think if you've got a fired up group of Democrats who might've set out, perhaps Republicans are a little disaffected, independents are now saying, I've got to vote because abortion is such an affront to my values and to what I consider the rights of, of women. Isn't that a problem? Well, I would argue to you, Larry, that uh, independents were already motivated to vote. The only uh, turnout, which is what uh, it appears our colleagues on the other side of the aisle are doing, they gave up on the independents a while ago. They've seen the numbers that we have. So uh, for them, it's all been about anything but the economy. It's been about anything but uh, crime. These, by the way, are the issues that the independent voters in these very swing districts that we're talking about uh, are concerned with. Th those are their number one issues. Larry, uh, what you're looking at, I believe, and we can respectfully disagree again uh, if, you, uh, if you don't see it this way, but you're literally seeing 2018 in the reverse. In 2018, independent voters in these swing districts across this country were, were aligned with Democrats and they were voting like Democrats for months now. For months now, independent voters and Republicans have been perfectly aligned on the top two issues. The last battleground survey I had before abortion uh, uh, became this issue, which would be interesting to see what it looks like now, but I do have uh, uh, district-specific stuff that tells me it's not having the impact with independent voters in specific targeted races that we're talking about, uh, which is why I can talk that way. But I'll, I'll say this, uh, the... The race uh, in these uh, targeted districts, the top two issues for Republicans and independents, it has and has remained inflation, in the economy and crime. And the top two issues for Democrat voters in those districts uh, has been uh, January. No, it's been uh, COVID. Sorry, COVID and, uh, and climate change and not necessarily in that order. Climate change has typically been number, number one. Um, do you would you are you recommending to uh, candidates that you're talking to that they look to um, to project a message about abortion that either is less specific about details that talks about concern about the health of women um, rather than talking about 
kind of the specifics of a ban on abortion, or perhaps talking about exceptions related to rape, incest, and the health of the mother. I mean, is that is that part of, of how you're going to respond to whatever uh, change has been created by the Dobbs decision? These, uh, it's a state decision. Nothing's changed. This is up to the state, uh, period. The idea that this somehow made uh, abortion illegal across the country is frankly just uh, false information. And that's why I think uh, Kansas is a great example. It's probably going to work to Republicans' favor because it shows people in this country who want to have a, a more uh, control over their own say as to what happens. Uh, that's essentially what the court did. So, no, what, what I trust uh, our candidates, Larry, to know their districts, to know the people they're talking to. I, I've told them specifically, go ahead, answer the question as you uh, see appropriate in your district. Uh, remember, it's a state issue now, but then turn back to the issues that people are most concerned with. It's inflation in the economy. It's crime. It's our southern border. Uh, it, those are the issues that, that continue to be the issues of primary concern for voters all across this country. Yeah, so in other words, what you're saying is make it a referendum on the conditions under Joe Biden and Democrats. It, it, and don't, don't get pulled off track to talk about abortion because that's not an issue that's going to work well for Republicans. But let me ask you about uh, Angie Craig in the second congressional district um, in Minnesota. Uh, she's been winning uh, close races, as you know, um, and uh, some of the projections show her slightly ahead this time. She cannot talk about almost any other issue but abortion. Uh, she sees it as a great issue to get those voters uh, who are maybe going to sit out the race or weren't sure they're going to vote uh, to get them to the, the voting booth, to get their ballots in. Um, is that the kind of swing race, though, where abortion could make an impact if, if Angie Craig, the Democrat, is successful? Well, actually, it shows exactly what I told you earlier. Uh, without an answer to inflation, without uh, acknowledging that uh, this administration, frankly, uh, started the, uh, the inflation problem by destroying Americans' energy independence the very first day that Joe Biden took office without uh, acknowledging that the $1.9 trillion American Rescue Plan uh, really is the thing that kicked it into motion. Uh, even uh, uh, Lawrence Summers said it was going to happen back in February at the beginning, February of uh, 2021. Uh, without talking about those issues and how you're going to solve the number one problem that our uh, voters in that district and across Minnesota are having, which is how do I pay for groceries? This gas is out of control and I love now. Oh, well, gas has come down. Ladies and gentlemen, it's still $2 more a gallon than it was the day that Joe Biden took office. I literally, uh, it looks like what my colleague is doing is exactly what the playbook is uh, for Nancy Pelosi nationally, which is we got to talk about anything that tries to get our people a little bit more excited to get them out, because that's the only chance we have to perhaps save uh, a few seats. So I think that's uh, consistent. But Minnesotans, I believe, are also uh, aware of that. And I know, uh, Angie, I get along with Angie, but uh, this, is a, uh, this is a tough spot to be in. Yeah, it sure is. Uh, there's no doubt that the environment and conditions facing Democrats is difficult. And uh, for those of you who don't follow um, elections closely, um, there's kind of a lay down hand when you've got a president um, with approval ratings that are weak, below 40% is considered to be terrible. And Joe Biden's earned that territory. And so then the president's party has lost uh, all but two midterm elections going back forever. Um, so this is the, the Republicans have a strong hand going into um, November and and Congressman Emmers is, um, you know, frankly, you're you're making this presentation a Democrat would make um, during years when things were not going so well for for Republicans. Whether it was, you know, back when Joe um, when George Bush was president or Donald Trump in 2018, it's just they're bad conditions, and it hurts it hurts the whole party. Um, do you think things have changed though in the last, you know? few weeks or months, there, there's a media um, kind of whispering campaign that maybe the campaign is shifting the abortion decision, clearly part of it, but also the big jobs numbers that have been coming out, over half a million new jobs created 
uh, the gas price is coming down. Um, the legislation, you know, we could talk about different parts of it, but the effort to reduce uh, the price of prescription drugs in Medicare, uh, that's something of real concern to seniors who tend to vote at a higher rate than other groups. Does it feel like the, the campaign is in a more unsettled state than it had been a month ago? Not for me. Uh, Larry, this, this takes us back two years ago. I mean, I remember, and I, I complained to uh, David Wasserman at Cook, two years ago, uh, July of uh, 2020, uh, the, uh, all the prognosticators in Washington put out pieces. I, I mean, I, I gave uh, Wasserman a hard time a few months back because the headline in political was Cook Report moves 20 races from red to blue, you know, and they, they were, uh, look, there were things going on in June of 2020. Uh, the president uh, had tanked on uh, COVID handling and there were all kinds of excess, excessive or uh, outside noise that was filling the environment. Uh, but you know what? I was looking at polls uh, the second week of July 2020, one of which was right here in Minnesota, where an unknown candidate by the name of Tyler Kistner was in a dead heat with a uh, Republican, uh, I'm sorry, with a Democrat incumbent named Nancy Craig. And it was like, wait a second. And I start looking at these uh, different things. As I've told Wasserman, your problem when you poll is you have a bias. I mean, back then it was really bad. It was a Trump derangement syndrome bias. I mean, everything was being looked at through Trump colored glasses, as opposed to understanding that congressional races are the largest local race on the ballot. And yes, they can be impacted by national uh, issues. They can be issued, but if you build your brand separate, uh, if you are that uh, you know uh, uh, guy or gal on the street corner that's a customer service rep and understands your job is to be a public servant, not to be uh, dictating uh, what people are supposed to do. I don't care if you're a Republican or a Democrat. You're probably going to do uh, pretty well in good times and in bad. Uh, it just depends on if you're doing the work. So uh, this time, you, you can say that, Larry. There, there, in my mind, is an assault on uh, our senses right now from different communication medium from all over the place that look at this and look at that. I love the things, though, that come out and say, all right, I mean, I got all this noise going on. I'm just going to go based on what history tells me. And history tells me when I see this kind of partisan turnout every uh, 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 midterm election, I, I mean, you know, you might have seen the tweet. I can't remember who did it, Colyard or something a few weeks ago, two weeks ago that said, uh, you know, Democrats are, are going to lose. Democrats aren't going to lose. Democrats are going to lose. Democrats aren't going to lose. Democrats, oh, they lost. Uh, the, the real question, I believe we will win the majority. I'm still very confident about that. The question is, you know, what's the number going to be? What's it going to look like? And that's what about, that. Let me ask you about that. Um, your committee came out and is uh, targeting 70 Democratic seats um, and 12 or seats that Trump won in 2020. So it makes sense there's a Democrat in there. But there, there are 30, 33 of those seats that Biden won by over 10 points. So, and, and by contrast, if you look at Cook and others, they're not seeing 70 seats. They're seeing something much smaller. They see very competitive uh, midterm elections. They point out that back in 2020, those 13 net uh, Republican pickups, a bunch of them were marginal seats. Democrats would hold by a little bit, and now Republicans. And so they, they don't see the playing field as broad as you do. But what are you seeing that you think 70 are actually in play? You're willing to put money into them. See, that's why, Larry, you're wonderful to talk to because you're gracious. I mean, you're right some of the time. I'm wrong. I'm right some of the time. You're wrong. Uh, we treat each other like Minnesotans should. You know, it's it, we don't. But I'm not going to be that nice to uh, Cook and all the other ones. Oh, yeah. Go back now and tell us, oh, well, this is what we were seeing. Too. You guys are so wrong. And you've been wrong. No, I don't pay attention to Cook. I don't look at what they're doing because I don't think they're accurate. They're fun. They're great. It's kind of like watching my MLB app when, look, the Twins got another hit. But here, here's what is, here's, it, what is it that gets you to 70 seats? It's, I'll tell you. I mean, so, 33 districts where Biden was won by double digit. It's just it, it, 
Yeah. Help actually, me. actually, we targeted 75. Uh, we are now down to 74 because we want a, a seat in the uh, uh, in South Texas that Republicans haven't held in 150 years. Myra Flores uh, recently picked it up in a special election uh, where uh, that seat, even though the Biden number wasn't quite as high in the last election, Philemon Vila, who held the seat, he won it by 13 points. And everybody looks at it and says, uh, well, there's no path. She's going to lose the next one because that's uh, a D plus 15 seat. I got news for you. The change is happening down in uh, in uh, on the border. Uh, not only do I believe, even though it's a tougher road, that Myra Flores can and will be reelected in November, I think we're going to pick up two other seats in uh, in South Texas. I think uh, Cassie Garcia is going to beat Henry Cuellar. And I think uh, uh, the gal who started it all, uh, De La Cruz, Monica De La Cruz, who with about $400,000 in the last campaign cycle, darn near took out Vicente Gonzalez. I think she lost by two or three points. That's what I talked about. You see a political realignment occurring. So to your question, uh, this is the caution I've given everyone on our team for months now. In 2010, uh, Republicans picked up 63 seats in the House. John McCain won 48 of those, okay? Uh, this cycle, you correctly point out out of the 75 original that we targeted, 74 now, uh, Donald Trump uh, only won 12 of those. I think the next 17 plus are uh, actually the next, uh, what is it, 12? So it's like 20 some. Yeah, like 25 somewhere in there uh, are zero. So it's like the uh, Angie Craig, uh, Tyler Kistner seat, uh, a dead even uh, district, or they, they go up to plus 10 Biden. Uh, and then you correctly point out I think it's 33 above that that go uh, 11 plus. They can get even bigger. Uh, look, uh, Mike Garcia in uh, California's 25th congressional district, the suburbs of Los Angeles, uh, that was the first seat that we had flipped in 20 years from a Democrat to a Republican. And we did that last cycle in the special. And then Mike held on in the, uh, in the general. Mike's got a district this time that's uh, D plus 12, and we expect to hold that seat. You ask me why, I'll tell you why. Uh, you look at Virginia, you look at uh, New York, you look at New Jersey, you look at all of these places that we have uh, some empirical evidence now, not just the, uh, the actual polling that we do, uh, but we have the candidates, we have the message, which is very clear, we have the message. The question for us is the resources, all right? Uh, we've targeted those 74 seats. If we have enough money, Larry, I, I saw one in Maryland that you would never expect us to play in. It's a seat that if we have the money, we can win that seat in Maryland. I, I think you're going to be uh, surprised. And again, I, I, I say all this, but the caution that I give to our guys, uh, the election, yes, early voting will start earlier, but the only poll that matters is the one that takes place on November 8th. Right, right. So before everybody gets over their skis, and then I've, I've had to caution some people too, you got to understand, if we win, I think it's 20, uh, 28 seats, uh, it's a bigger majority than, uh, than 2010. I think if we win uh, just less than 20, it's a bigger majority than the wave of 1994. And if we win just 34 seats, just 34, and include that uh, top uh, 12 uh, that Trump won in it. That's a that's the biggest Republican majority in 100 years, more than 100 years, I believe. Yeah. No, it's been, the, the margins have been very small. We've got a bunch of questions here from our friends listening in. Uh, let me get to a few of them. Um, one question asked is, it really why are we talking so much about uh, candidates who are increasingly uh, female and minority? Um, when there's really a debate about what constitutes a woman or a man, and minority Republicans are often written off as sellouts. I, I don't know how I answer that. I know what a woman and a man is. Uh, and that's the way uh, I'm talking about them. So yeah, I think our uh, districts are gonna be represented by uh, people, uh, Republicans, uh, more and more Republicans that uh, better reflect the districts that they're representing. So, so however so however your uh, questioner wants to define that is fine with me, but I'm just doing it from the perspective that I have. Let me give you an example of some of the Republican candidates that I've been following. Um, there's a candidate in Mich Michigan who's a West, uh, West Point graduate, businessman, um, and John running- yeah, and he's running a campaign based on um, 
focus on crime and job creation and bringing inflation down. Um, a lot of the candidates you've been mentioning who are Latino running in Texas, a similar platform. So if they're getting criticized as sellouts, does that really matter? Aren't voters hearing a message from them that resonates more with their concerns? I don't think so, but that's an interesting one that you bring up because you know that my colleagues on the other side of the aisle spent about a half a million dollars uh, in the primary trying to get John Gibbs through because they want to run against John Gibbs. Uh, they may regret that. And I actually, I believe they're going to regret it because they did the same thing to Mike Garcia in uh, in uh, L.A. That's exactly what they did. They they spent about a seven figure number because they wanted to uh, they wanted to run against uh, somebody else. And it it really uh, blew back on them. So, uh, look, I trust the candidates, whether it's John Gibbs or anybody else. They know their districts. Like I said, it's the largest uh, local race on the uh, on the ballot, uh, and if if you know the people, your voters, they may not agree. By the way, with people who are listening to this call, Larry, uh, they may not agree with where the national news media, the uh, the journalistic elites, uh, think that they should be on the issues. Uh, but you know what? They're speaking to the people on the ground, and John Gibbs won that primary the other day. I think uh, based on what he's doing. I think John Gibbs is going to be the next congressman from Michigan's third district. Does it worry you that uh, candidates are winning the nomination for Republican Party who are questioning um, the proven outcome of the 2020 presidential race? Yeah, I, I, I don't comment on that because I don't know everything that people are saying out there. Uh, the key is focusing on the future. I think people that are focusing on the past, uh, you can't be looking in the rearview mirror, Larry. Uh, if you want to look in the rearview mirror, then maybe you should sit this one out, take a chair and watch uh, watch from the sidelines. We got to be talking about the future. And I think that's how we are successful. And so that that conflicts with Donald Trump's approach, which has been to talk about the 2020 election and um, the fact that it was stolen, even though we've had you know, more than 60 judges weigh in on this, including some that a former president had uh, nominated. Okay, well, here, here's the issue. Uh, private citizens, which our former president is one, they can do whatever they want. That's their business. I'm going to focus on 2022 and the election in front of us. And I, that's what I suggest to every single one of our candidates who's running. You, you got to focus on your district. You got to focus on if people are hurting right now, Larry. I mean, the disastrous policies of the Biden administration have made everything more expensive, have put their families at risk. I mean, the middle class in this country is getting destroyed right now. And their only answer, their only answer is to come back uh, to Washington this Friday and pass another three quarters of a trillion dollars. Uh, and by the way, hire 87,000 IRS agents. That's 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 17 17 brigades of tax collecting soldiers. And I should tell you, it's very disturbing to me because uh, the number one thing that our office deals with, uh, our caseworkers have to work with IRS issues, uh, refunds and all kinds of issues. Instead of, you know, I could see an argument from the Biden administration to hire caseworkers to process backlogs of IRS stuff. But the fact that they are hiring enforcement agents, 87,000 enforcement agents, which will make uh, the IRS bigger than uh, the State Department, bigger than Homeland Security, bigger than the Border Patrol. Uh, it's insane. Congressman, uh, doesn't it disturb you that we have uh, wealthy Americans who hire high-priced lawyers um, and accountants to get them out of paying taxes unfairly? They owe taxes. They don't pay their fair share. You and I pay our taxes. Why shouldn't they? And isn't that the role of the IRS to make sure that we all pay you know, our fair share. Well, and we need 87,000 enforcement agents to chase down billionaires. I got news for you, Larry. They're not chasing down billionaires. They're coming after us, Main Street USA. And if that was the Democrats' argument, then you got to explain to me how they pulled out the billionaire's tax uh, before they sent it over to uh, the House. Cinema didn't want these, uh, these guys taxed. They agreed. They pulled it out. It's it's pretty amazing uh, when you look at it because I, I I hear what you're arguing, but that's not what they did. They protected the billionaires, and they're coming after the middle class. So Cinema Senator Cinema from Arizona 
hold out what is known as uh, carried interest, which affects hedge funds and other um, investors. But the Democrats did leave in a minimum tax of 15% on corporations. And that's to make sure we don't have large corporations uh, that have revenue in the billions um, that are not paying their fair share. That's, that is the primary funder for legislation just past the Senate. Um, let me ask you another question. This is well, from- but Before you leave that though, Larry, because it sounds great. And it polls wonderfully when you ask people, hey, do you think the corporation should pay more? Here's the problem that my colleagues on the other side of the aisle are missing. And I, I hope people are starting to understand, because if they don't, they're going to see it at the ballot box. The average American doesn't need a college education, doesn't need a, a PhD or a master's to understand that you're talking about taxing a corporation, which will pass that right on to you, the consumer. Uh, the tax they took out was the one, if you are really talking about taxing the wealthy, uh, that's the one that they took out. If you're talking about just playing a shell game and passing it right on through to the consumer, I mean, you're hitting everybody over $30,000. $30,000 and over is going to pay more taxes because of what they're doing on Thursday. And it's not going to address inflation. It's not going so to address just, crime. So just to be clear, the tax is on corporations. What you're talking about is this indirect effect that might uh, land on, on workers. On the other hand, the legislation also passed along a number of benefits to those workers, including more subsidies for health insurance and lower Medicare prescription drugs. So those effects are, yeah, you could be right, but then there are these positive effects. Let me ask you a question. We've got one here from Margaret Miller. She is a constituent um, and she wants to ask you about your vote for the Respect for Marriage Act. Um, I would like to know why Congressman voted for this legislation. Does he feel he represented his district with this vote? Absolutely. I think everybody should have voted uh, the same way I did. Unfortunately, it was, uh, it was kind of a short notice uh, thing. Look, anybody who knows me, Larry, has known my, my entire political career. I want less government involved in my life. Uh, certainly, I want less government involved in other people's lives. And it's interesting because if people suggest that this vote uh, was uh, was something else, really, that, that's all it was. It already is the law of the land. We didn't vote to legalize anything. Uh, we voted to keep government out of uh, people's lives. But I would also add, uh, this was really a despicable, despicable, twisted political move by Nancy Pelosi to further divide us. That's all it was. And it goes back to what we were talking about earlier. She doesn't want to talk about inflation in the economy. She doesn't want to talk about crime. She doesn't want to talk about the southern border. She doesn't want to talk about what is the worry of every uh, average American today. No, she wants to distract us all, and she wants us all fighting with each other. So, yeah, Mary, I, I do think uh, it was the correct vote. I wish I would have had a little bit more time than Nancy gave us to uh, share this with a lot of my colleagues, uh, because the thing that most people don't realize, too, is that bill... It didn't just say uh, marriages between uh, uh, two people of the same sex. It said uh, race. It said uh, 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 international uh, uh, origin and uh, uh, ethnicity. So it goes way beyond that. And obviously, uh, I, I don't have a problem with any of those things. But just to kind of build on what you just said, when you say the government should be involved in our private lives, does that extend to uh, women's choice over reproduction? Should well, the government be involved in saying, no, you, you can't have an abortion, even if that's your choice? Larry, I'm going to let uh, our state legislature make that decision. I mean, we vote for people at our state legislature. I vote for them. Uh, as Dobbs, I believe, correctly has concluded, and I think as you'll see in the future on issues like this as well, these are issues for the state. Uh, this is what our founders uh, created, this, uh, this beautiful thing where the federal government is there to protect Americans and our property. Essentially, that is all. Uh, and the states are the great laboratories of individual freedom and, uh, and constitutional governance. And we've been getting away from that. I find Dobbs to be uh, a breath of fresh air because we're turning it back to the states. That's where Mary and I and you can make a difference uh, in our own state. But you voted for a national piece of legislation on uh, Respect for Marriage Act. And then when it comes to abortion, that shouldn't be decided at the national level. That should be decided at the state level. Well, can, I can I help with that. I can. I would argue to you that if you pass a national law, it's probably going to go the same. If somebody wants to challenge it, 
is probably going to go the same way of Dobbs and be restored to the states. It's these are state issues. So, I, but yeah, the uh, again, this was uh, uh, something that was consistent with what I've done in the past, and I think it was a twisted political move by a very shrewd uh, political gambler named Nancy Pelosi. Okay. Um, we haven't talked about foreign policy, and um, it, it, it's a topic I, I I don't hear much talked about this season. Um, it's not a presidential election year, so I, I kind of get it, but. We have some huge foreign policy issues. Uh, this may be one of the most important moments in U.S. foreign policy. We've got the war with Russia and Ukraine. Um, and there are a group of Republicans in the kind of Make America Great um, um, of the Republican Party who have been pretty supportive of Putin and raising real questions about American support for Ukraine. And, you know, I'll be honest with you, I grew up in the Cold War. I grew up very close to West Point and lots of friends who served there. I don't understand it. Help me understand why it is that that there are Republicans who are supporting this butcher um, in Russia. Well, I disagree with your premise. There is no Republican that I know of. Uh, that is in our elected uh, house that is supportive of what Vladimir Putin is doing. None. Uh, contrary to what the reports are and contrary to how uh, people uh, have their uh, their words uh, distorted, uh, look, there is no one that supports that. There's a lot of debate over the Ukrainian issue. I think uh, the debate is not about whether or not the Ukrainians should be allowed to defend themselves and protect themselves. The debate is really, uh, and it's it's past in my mind, but the debate is really why wouldn't the Biden administration send the uh, the weapons that were requested uh, last October before the uh, the advance by Putin, uh, the attack by Putin that took place uh, in the first quarter of this year. Uh, for some reason, Antony Blinken kept telling uh, the leadership on the Republican side in the House that it would be provocative. We can't allow that to happen. It'll be provocative. Well, they they waited, they waited, they waited. Uh, and unfortunately, then uh, Putin started and then the debate became uh, really about should the uh, U.S. Uh, be helping uh, financially. And I know that was a very controversial vote, uh, one that I took, uh, but controversial for everybody. Uh, from my standpoint, I wish uh, my colleagues on the other side of the aisle would have uh, would have constructed that uh, differently. But, you know, I felt I had no choice but to support it. Uh, because at this moment in time in in world's history, uh, I do believe that uh, we needed to support the Ukrainians' ability to protect themselves from. Okay, and, that, and that's the position I recognize. And to me, um, you know, studying what what Putin has proposed and intends to do, it is the only way which we're going to defend democracy in Europe. And a lot of those former Eastern European countries are under threat from Putin. He's been very clear about it. Among the Republicans, and I did a little bit of research here, have been expressing support for Putin, Madison Cawthorn, Marjorie Taylor, Paul Gossar, Matt Rosendale, Mary Miller, and the list goes on. It's it's not a few. And and the comments, you know, in, in honesty, are partly about Ukraine and their trustworthiness, but it's also about Putin. And, um, you know, I, I just don't recognize that in, in the Republican Party. Well, I, I disagree with you again, Professor. I uh, I do not believe that any one of those people has made any uh, a clear statement that they support what Vladimir Putin is doing. Uh, do they have criticisms? Have they been involved in the debate? I'm sure they have. And I'm sure that uh, uh, some very uh, uh, partisan reporters have taken their statements and uh, and built them up. I've, I've been watching this for two years. And by the way, for me, it, it was the right vote. It was really tough because it just it was a lot of money. It didn't have a lot of, uh, of the protections on it. I think at the end of the day, two things uh, uh, got my vote. One, I think you got to send a message to the world that America is not going to run away especially that because this goes well beyond Vladimir Putin. You got China watching, you have Iran watching. This yeah. is, uh, there's right. a whole bunch of potential yeah. bad actors out there that are uh, taking cues from how we react to the situation in Ukraine. But it was also about restoring America's defenses. 
because while we have been sending these uh, stockpiles to uh, to our our allies in Poland, uh, you know, and on the uh, in uh, in Europe to share, I understand with the Ukrainians. Uh, we still have to uh, uh, restore that here. And uh, a lot of that money was restoring our own uh, capacity at the same time. Uh, but no, I, 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 I hear what you're saying, but I end up talking to these people uh, after and I get a different, I get a different version. Uh, and I see how the words can be taken out of context. So most of the time, I uh, it's it's people be better off not talking to some of these uh, reporters or talking in some of these places. Okay, let me uh, ask you about China, which you raised. Nancy Pelosi um, unnecessarily provoked China. Um, you know, we've seen after her visit this kind of simulation of a possible invasion, which has I think rattled a lot of people. Um, or was Nancy Pelosi doing the right thing to demonstrate American will? that we're not gonna be cowered by China. Was she right or wrong? Larry, is, uh, is China our ally or is Taiwan our ally? I mean, I, I, I come down to uh, Americans should not be uh, threatened. Americans should not be uh, this idea uh, that uh, America should uh, bow down to uh, uh, dictators uh, in potential uh, bad actors, I, I think is a bad idea. That being said, I can't comment on what Nancy's doing. There seems to be a, uh, a serious uh, a difference of opinion, uh, miscommunication, uh, something going on between uh, uh, our speaker and the White House. Oh, yeah. Because he, even though they're, they're cleaning it up after the fact, and they're, you know, they're trying to sandpaper off the sharp edges and the, I, something was going on a couple of weeks ago that uh, it, they just aren't on the same page. So I'm not sure what that's all about. And, and I, I hear where you're coming from, but I, whether it's a Republican or a Democrat in the office, I find it very, uh, it's going to be very difficult for me, for you to get me to criticize them directly uh, when they're making foreign policy decisions. Because, uh, you know, I, with the last administration, frankly, with the previous administration, with the Obama administration, I've been reluctant to do that. It's going to have to be stark for me to look at you and say they were absolutely wrong. I mean, the one example that I'll give you that I did comment on was Afghanistan. And I, I stand by that. That was just incompetence at its hilt. And we did not need to lose those 13 American soldiers. That was tragic and it never should have happened. But other than that, I have not, I've tried not to step over that line. I just, uh, these are these are uh, sensitive topics that you got to give the administration, which was duly elected, the ability to make these decisions uh, and, and set a course. I mean, I, I don't think I have to tell you that I haven't been pleased. I think there have been uh, some uh, confusion. Well, I, I, I respect that. And I would say, I don't think there is, you know, uh, a course that any administration could, could plot with regards to China. That's not going to be white knuckle affair. Um, they are a huge country. They are a growing military and economic power. And um, if they have a determined will and they're willing to absorb the cost of invading Taiwan, there's really nothing we can do to stop them. Um, oh, that's, I disagree with that. I, I really? totally disagree with you that. You think yeah. militarily we could stop China? From I, I'm invading? not going to talk. You're talking one dimensional. Uh, everybody makes China look like uh, it, it's the business model of the future. Uh, China's got all kinds of problems. Sure. I, you know, they, they've got a business model that, yes, is top down and their citizens have to behave much differently than free citizens of the United States of America, Larry. Uh, and that that can work. But for how long? And uh, you uh, we make it look as though their economy is so strong. No, their economy is, frankly, in my mind, it's a bit of a magic trick. And uh, it's really about uh, making sure that around the world. Uh, we solidify our relationships with our existing allies, with uh, whether it's uh, Africa or wherever, South America, that they know that the United States of America is going to be there so that uh, uh, the uh, those that might replace us don't. And I think that's where it, it's a it's a more complicated answer than uh, than the question you asked me, I think. We've got a question here from one of our friends. Uh, what solutions can you and other Republicans offer to farmers who are experiencing crop failures due to the changing climate in Minnesota, including um, severe drought? Yeah, well, 
Look, the uh, I, we got a lot of rain last night. We're going to have a good crop this year. I, I, I'm not sure where uh, your, uh, your, the person is that's uh, sending the note, but I think Minnesota farmers are going to have a pretty good year this year. And uh, I th I'm more worried about uh, next year, Larry, because uh, before this year started, you know, when last uh, fall, a year ago, when the harvest was finished up, most of our farmers are, uh, uh, are setting their inputs, right? They're, they're uh, setting their contracts for the next season. And that was done almost a year ago now. Uh, that was before double digit inflation. That was before fertilizer just uh, tripled in cost. That was before yeah. all of these issues that have been caused by this, uh, this uh, the policies of this administration, which are gonna be exacerbated, I'm afraid on uh, Friday. Uh, but now my bigger concern is we better start to figure out how we help these farmers uh, survived through one of the most dire economic times we've ever seen. You know, the last time was probably when you and I were much younger, the end of the 70s. Uh, the difference between now and the end of the 70s is at the end of the 70s, we didn't have $30 trillion of debt. Today, we got $30.6 trillion of debt. Every man, woman, and child in this country right now owes approximately $242,000 to the debt. Uh, that's the bigger issue because you can put this business back, the business of uh, the federal government back on track and start generating money, which it is. I mean, it's collecting more taxes, more whatever than ever before, but you got to get your spending under control. And then uh, to the, uh, the person who asked the question, once you get the spending under control, once you uh, get the debt under control, once you restore what is uh, the good economic policy of, of the United States of America... I think then you can look uh, more closely at some of these other things you're talking about. Problem is, if we don't get this under control, you're not going to be do, able so, to do any of the things you're talking about. So, Congressman, about. I'm not hearing you suggesting more government spending or, or more no, government programs. I'm not. Okay. Let me, I think let me, we got to get the ones we've got under control. Okay. I've got a, just a few last questions here as we're running out of time. Uh, one of our uh, friends here is wondering, have you been able to meet with each member of the House personally as you suggested when you ran for office. Yeah, I, the, the last uh, three years have been uh, a little bit different, but yes, I did uh, beforehand. It's, uh, it's, it's a very interesting experience because uh, I still have some uh, very close colleagues on the other side of the aisle. Uh, and I'm looking forward to uh, reuniting, uh, as we say, going forward with new members that are gonna come in from both parties, uh, or I should say uniting with new members that are gonna come in from and, both and parties. Why is, why is that important for you to sit down and, and meet your colleagues? I mean, well, so I many think, members don't do that. I think it's important for all of us because you, uh, you have completely different outlooks, right? Uh, but you uh, ultimately want the same things. Uh, maybe not getting them the same way, but you want people to have a better life. You want clean air and clean water. You want to have a great economy. You want to have a great education system. You want people to be safe and secure in their homes, their communities, in the country and around the world. Those are all shared values, Larry. Uh, and I think once you sit down with somebody, uh, one of the guys I do work with, we do not agree on, on uh, politics at all, but I do a ton of work in the crypto space with a guy named Richie Torres, who's a uh, uh, member from New York. Uh, you, Tom Emmer and Richie Torres, if you put them in the same room and had them talk about my vision for uh, how we govern ourselves and Richie his, you'd walk away going, I must be in two different countries. But I respect Richie and I think he respects me. You'd have to ask him. Uh, and we do uh, agree on certain things when it comes to our financial system. So I think that's what makes it important, Larry. If you don't get to know somebody, if you don't know why they're there, if you don't know what motivates them, uh, then you're always going to be opposed to them. And I think uh, bottom line is we got to find ways to work together. I ask you a last question. Maybe the subtitle is the education of Tom Emmer. We met maybe <laughs> uh, a dozen years ago, more than that. It was before the gubernatorial race in 2010. And a few times we had breakfast or got together and then we did some stuff together. He's and, I always, and I appreciated it. And I, and I am thankful for that. Um, and it strikes me when I look at some of your more recent vote, including for the Marriage Act uh, recently, you were one of the few uh, in the leadership who did not vote to overturn the 2020 election. And you referred earlier to it being a duly elected Joe Biden. You know, it sounds like a more, I don't know, 
balanced Tom Emmer, a Tom Emmer who's kind of, uh, you know, has a kind of stature and a standing and is charting maybe a course that's different from a lot of other Republicans. Am I off course there? I mean, help me. <laughs> uh, Larry, Professor, you have uh, you have been a good friend over the years. You were very patient with me before. Uh, it's really funny to me. My wife, Jackie, and I talk about this once in a while when people say, oh, you've changed. And Jackie's like, no, you haven't changed. I mean, I will. she will tell you I'm more patient. I, I still wear my emotions on my sleeve, but I'm more patient uh, in listening and talking to other people about where we're coming from. No, I, I would argue that uh, because there was 30 million bucks spent uh, against us in that race uh, a decade ago, Larry, uh, Jackie and I still talk about how it made us look like people we've never seen or known before. When I was in the legislature, sure, I was a, uh, a fire-breathing uh, bomb thrower, but that yeah. was my job. Remember, I, you know, before I went to the legislature, I was a, I, a, a lawyer. I did mostly defense work, people who got sued by the uh, trial lawyers. Uh, that was my job, uh, to represent my side and to explain what was different. And if, if nothing else, I hope it was entertaining at times. But now my whole uh, uh, purpose is to be thoughtful and to uh, represent everybody. I still have the same views, the same core values, and I still fight harder than ever. Otherwise, I wouldn't be there. But uh, I, I do think these times require people who do the right thing for the right reason and then can defend it back at home. And that's all I was trying to do with my colleagues in the last couple of weeks is tell them it, the right uh, it, perspective, you should always be able to explain to your voters, uh, you know, the people that you represent, what they don't want. They don't want somebody in Congress or an elected office, Larry, that go like this every day. Which way is the wind blowing? I'm going that way, you know, and then the, you run to the front of the crowd and you go, follow me. No, leadership is not leading people to where they are. It's leading them to where they need to be. And I just, uh, you know, if anything, maybe I've gotten a little bit more, uh, I, I, don't know. I, I don't I don't think I have. <laughs> I don't think I have. I'll leave that to you. I, I'm going to call that, uh, what do they call that? Fake news. I'll call that fake news. No, no, no. no. I'm not looking to create fake news. I got My it. view is that I've seen a change and maybe it's different roles. I, I think that's a fair explanation um, because I knew some of that fire breathing and we had animated conversations, uh, you know, privately. So, um, and, you know, I think you're, you are charting a different course than some of your colleagues. And I think the Marriage Act, I think your vote on the 2020 presidential election are good examples of that. In any case, Congressman, I know you're very busy. You've been generous with your time. Uh, I want to thank you very much for joining us. Um, we look forward to chatting again. Thank you, Larry. Hang in there. I'm glad we're coming out of the pandemic. Get back in the classroom. They want you. Okay. We're, we're going to be there. Thank All you. Right. Thank you, guys. Okay, great. Just want to give a quick uh, shout out to our next program, which is uh, coming up on Thursday, this Thursday. Um, it's 11.30 to 1. Uh, the title of it is A Better Path for Achieving Public Safety. It is a remarkable uh, program that's going to include uh, Minneapolis's new public com uh, safety, community safety uh, director, um, uh, Dr. Cedric Alexander. It's going to include uh, Attorney General Keith Ellison, Washington, D.C., um, uh, Maestro, uh, Norm Ornstein will be there. Uh, Supreme Court uh, Justice will be there. A number of experts are going to be joining us to talk about uh, the possibility of looking at another approach to public safety that fully incorporates mental health. Mental health, it's a, a model that's been emerging around the country. It certainly has some elements in Minnesota. The question is about pushing it forward. Please join us Thursday for that. Very excited about it. Uh, also want to let you know that um, if you'd like to get a copy of this program, um, it, it is coming up um, and you can get it uh, as a video in the next day or so. Um, and here's the link. You can also just search on Dialogue Cross Difference and get the podcast, which is on all your favorite podcast uh, viewers. And finally, let me just give a shout out to those who support us by making a donation. Um, all of our programs are free and open to the public. 
Um, if you'd like to be part of that circle of friends, let us know and here's some information how you get in touch with us. Once again, thank you, Congressman Tom Emmer, and thanks to all of you for joining us.